from Microbe TV. This is Tweevo, This Week in Evolution, episode number 65, recorded on February 24, 2021. I'm Vincent Dracaniello, and you're listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Nels LD. Hey, Vincent. Great to be with you back on podcasting together on Twivo. And even listening to that intro music in real time, it puts a little <laughs> <laughs> skip in my step. <laughs> yeah, it's good stuff. It's uh, Trampled by Turtles was, uh, was yep. your original choice. A great band hailing originally from Duluth, Minnesota, mm -hmm. and uh, on to national acclaim and kind of continuing their run. So great modern bluegrass crew, giving us a little energy great. coming into it. Yeah. So How have you been? First, uh, this is a first for uh, Tuivo. We're doing a live stream <laughs> on, uh, on YouTube. We've got 20 people watching. <laughs> welcome, and welcome. And uh, I can uh, highlight the comments here. And it, Lucy says, uh, thanks for the birthday present, guys. <laughs> okay, happy birthday, lucky sixes. Yeah. <laughs> um, just so happens every day is somebody's birthday. How's it going, Nels? I'm doing great. So i um, hanging in. Uh, I'm liking the trend lines here. Oh, Locally, yes. Locally, the um, totally. virus numbers are starting to drop. The vaccine numbers are starting to climb. And uh, feeling like, you know, some light at the end of the tunnel, but still a lot to discuss, a lot of um, questions, uh, evolution-related topics, and so a lot of science ahead. How about for you, Vincent? How are you these days? I'm uh, business as usual, you know, teaching my virology course, um, doing a lot of podcasting. Apparently, Nels, you have the best beard in the business. <laughs> well, I will confess that I've... Suspended all pers personal grooming uh, in, the <laughs> <laughs> in the last month or two, and um, just letting it ride. I'm going to ride this pandemic out. That's the game plan at this point. I got my second vaccine shot last week, so uh, I'm good. S spectacular. I'm, Congrats. I'm still being careful, again, of course. So we have people from Panama. Mm -hmm. We got Houston, Texas, Sweden. All right. Fantastic. Uh, we got Kentucky, <laughs> South Florida. We got the UK. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I I love how you can just engage the world with uh, this stuff. It's a great um, time to great time to be in the mix for sure. Turkey from Turkey, California. Hey, California, not too far from Nels. <laughs> Getting Moderna on Friday. Good oh, for you. Fantastic. Good great for news. you. So Nels is in his uh, his university office there, right? You're you're back there with all the scribbles on the wall. <laughs> Guilty as charged, coming from uh, LD Lab Studios. So, put on the KN95 mask and kind of hustled up the stairs to get in here here in time for our first live broadcast. Yeah, you, you thought you guys would like, uh, man, all over the place: California, Austria, Guatemala, Massachusetts. New Zealand, hey, Philly. Um, yeah, not everyone has the vaccine, but I think the vaccinations that we've done are making an impact. Also, we had a huge explosion of cases. That's leaving people immunized. That's and right. So uh, it's making a big deal. But uh, you said something earlier, Nels, it's interesting. You mm -hmm. said mm -hmm. we still have things to talk about. I think we're going to talk about this virus for a long time because all the data are going to be pouring in continuously, right? That's right. And it's kind of, as we've discussed, it's a, it's basically a fire hose of data, of information, um, uh, which is both truly exciting and groundbreaking in terms of the efforts of a lot of people to, to really uh, come together and try to, um, you know, navigate through this. But it's also quite overwhelming in the, the, just the amount of data that we're up against. Am I, mm. Vincent, am I freeze, am I freezing up on you? Yeah, you know, now and then it's okay. We'll Jumping be in okay. and out. Okay, hopefully that'll resolve a little bit. But um, yeah, there's going to be a lot to talk about uh, for the years ahead and to put into some context, which is what I think we're trying to do on Twivo yeah. is to take yeah. a little bit of this fire hose and to, um, you know, try to navigate through it a little bit. And we'll do that today with a couple of interesting studies or one one interesting study and then some catching up on some of the, some discussion on the variants that we continue to grapple with. 
A shout out to Andrew, who's in uh, New Zealand. He's a big Twip fan. I know it's him because he always says Kia Ora. <laughs> Good to see All you, right. Andrew. <laughs> yeah, uh, I have been doing. I've been doing a live stream uh, with Amy on t on uh, th Wednesday nights, and um, builds a nice community of people who want to talk about science. And so I yeah, thought you great. and I. It's a natural for you and I. So and look at this. I mean, Nels, we have. Uh, we got 82 people looking already, you know? <laughs> Wonder, you know, it's wonderful. And honestly, you know, we kind of do the show like a live stream anyway. And so why not <laughs> invite why some? Why not have people listening? Yeah. And, so, and and open up the conversation. And so please do weigh in uh, early and often here. And we'll try to respond in real time as we go as well. So, Vincent, I wanted to introduce a paper today, uh, or, mm -hmm. you know, a preprint that just came out through the BioArchive. Um, right. I think just maybe three or four days ago. It caught my eye, and I'll, I'll talk about why. Um, in a few minutes, but let's just set this up. So the title of the preprint is A Selective Sweep in the Spike Gene Has Driven SARS-CoV-2 uh, a Human Adaptation. Uh, so proposing that there's been a, uh, so this notion of a sweep when an, a mutation or a change in a virus genome in this case uh, might have an advantage. It will, mm -hmm. if, if that's true, um, the all of the genetic diversity other than this will be swept uh, to the side. And so this is a little bit different than the main topic of everyone's attention, which is all of the variants that are arising sort of in real time. Um, yeah. And we'll return to that. But this this sort of sets or frames a different question. And the question is, are, can we actually see maybe evidence of the transition when the ancestor, the predecessor mm -hmm. of SARS-2, spilled over, as we presume, from bats or another animal reservoir to humans, are there genetic changes associated with that that we might be able to trace? And actually that, you know, you can imagine that would give you some clues, even potentially for pandemics ahead. So are there signs of adaptation in the SARS-2 genome that could have contributed um, to a spillover event? So it kind of rewinds the tape back right. to 2019, you know, sort of mid-year or late year. Yeah. So this, uh, I got the... Um the preprint front page up here so we could acknowledge the, the author. Oh, fantastic. Here. Yeah, good idea. So um, uh, Lynn Kang, uh, first author, uh, co-corresponding senior authors. Um, this is um, Powell Michalak and uh, James uh, Uyghur uh, Lucarelli are the senior authors coming out of Virginia Tech and then also the Institute of Evolution in Haifa, Israel, so international team here. Um, I wasn't, I'm not familiar with the work of these authors, um, but I, the thing that really caught my eye again is just how they're framing, I think, a question that we, so certainly all kinds of interest mm -hmm. um, in the origins of SARS-2, sure. um, but sort of tackling that using some techniques of population genetics or evolutionary genetics. And so um, I thought it would be a good one for us to, to sort of I dig think into. This is, uh, this is great. It's different from, as you say, what we've been hearing and mm -hmm. It lets us uh, explain this idea of a sweep, right? I think that's really important. That's right. And so it's sort of, you know, it's kind of intuitive that um, uh, what a sweep might look like. You basically have a collection of all kinds of, you know, any population, sort of a collection of all kinds of variation. There's mm -hmm. some pivotal event, an environmental change, or, um, you know, an asteroid hits the earth, something. And then you have a sweep um, where there's less diversity on the other side of the sweep because you've selected four um, uh, mutational change right. um, or several mutational changes. And so there are tools in place, um, some used in this um, uh, preprint, but then other tools, many tools out there, that's sort of one of the big pursuits of population genesis is how do you identify these sort of um, you know interesting uh, genomic regions where somewhat recently there was a change that really that swept through the population. It took over, it came to dominate that population. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, what happens in these cases is um, whether it's a, a, a virus population, a human population, another population, is that you infer the past. You infer that there's been one of these adaptive sweeps that have happened based on um, sort of as you're comparing the whole genome, there's a, a, a lowering or there's less diversity around that change that you're sort of proposing mm -hmm. as being mm -hmm. an influential one. And this, you know, kind of harkens back to our, our high school textbooks and the idea of recombination. So given enough time, populations, um, both sexual and asexual in some cases, will start to 
recombine or exchange genetic information um, in a way that will diversify the genome. Will diversify, and so as you start to make comparisons, um, if you see a region with a, a low level of diversity, there that's a little bit suspicious that something um, consequential happened somewhat recently. There hasn't been mm -hmm. time for recombination to come back and sort of, um, you know, add back the diversity around that. And so um, that's one of the major platforms actually of population genetics. And so here, the authors are applying this idea to all of the, again, that fire hose of data. Now this is virus genomes, SARS-2 genomes. I think when they kind of did their capture from the um, GISAID database, something like 180,000 plus virus sequences, and then asked, are there some regions in the genome where you see this? Mm -hmm. You see a change, um, and then around it, sort of a, a, a lower level of overall diver of background sort of diversity um, in the genome. So the idea so, now is that yeah. here, SARS-CoV-2 likely emerged from a bat into humans, right? Mm -hmm. And in order to reproduce efficiently in humans, some change was needed. And so can we infer that change by looking at all the sequences of from people, because we don't have many from bats, obviously. That's right. And all the sequences, and look at places that aren't changing in the genome, right? Yep. But are different from some of those other closest relatives outside of SARS-2. Right. So, and that actually, I think that's kind of an interesting twist here. And there's, you know, there's some questions. We'll do some sort of podcast peer review here. Um, <laughs> and if, and if, it, <laughs> if anyone in the um, live stream audience wants to uh, throw in some uh, ideas, please feel free to, to jump in as well. Uh, well. We'll do some crowdsourcing peer review here. Um, but so the first question actually is just, you know, is this the right way to go about this? So mm -hmm. is, you know, is this tool potentially useful to identify uh, consequential adaptive change um, as uh, uh, proposed in the title of the paper um, that might be involved in that spillover event. And again, remember, this is sort of, you know, this is evolutionary genetics. So kind of turning back the clock, um, make using inferences. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, first they kind of say, well, what are the tools out there? And so one that you might use is one we've talked about on the show a lot, um, this so-called DNDS ratio. You're measuring the rates of non-synonymous substitutions to silent substitutions, which can be diagnostic of rapid evolution or sort of consequential evolution. Um, and they say, you know, those tools aren't so great for this because um, they're kind of set up for looking, compa doing comparisons of eukaryotic genomes. And that's right. true to some regard, um, absolutely true to so in some cases, although there is an entire package that uses DNDS sort of based kind of evidence um, that has been fine-tuned for thinking about viruses. So I would um, kind of take that idea with a little bit of um, grain of salt. Um, but there is a difference here that I do think is important, which is what we, when we're doing these sort of DNDS based analyses, what we're, um, what those algorithms are sort of tuned for are adaptive changes that have happened again and again, recurrent evolution. Mm -hmm. And those are algorithms are really good at pulling that out. And that's very common to host virus interfaces where you make sort of the notion of an arms race, a genetic conflict that's ongoing. The difference here is it's only a single event that we want to infer or, right. or would propose to infer, right? It's this, right. Right. Th that spillover. Um, so a, a massive environmental change, probably from a bat to a human cell. And how do you, as a virus showing up for the first day in a totally different species, how do you navigate all of that different cell biology, the different immune defenses, that you're sort of faced with as a virus population uh, for, for the first time. And so that's a, a single event. And so actually it does make sense to think about this, I think as an adaptive sweep and to sort of bring those tools to bear. So um, now in addition yeah. to all the SARS-CoV-2 sequences, what else do they bring into this? What other genomes? Yeah, no, so it starts with the SARS-2 and then they run these um, programs. I think one is called, I have to confess, I haven't used these tools before. One is called Omega Plus, one is called Raised. Um, I think the Omega Plus might have been where they they got more of their signal from that they used to, to so they run those and they see seven regions of the genome, intervals mm -hmm. of the genome, again, where there's sort of this reduction in overall diversity um, centered uh, potentially on an adaptive um, change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, the, and then now I'm getting to your question, which is then what do they do? And so, and I think this is um, pretty clever is to then say, okay, in that interval, the, that set of sequence, 
if we now compare outside of SARS-2, so we take some of the mm-hmm. closest relatives of SARS-2, I think they, there's a nice um, a little comparison in the one of the figures, five or six other viruses um, that are becoming, in some cases, kind of household names, the rat, BG2, or all of these, you know, the, uh, <laughs> all of the right. alphabet soup that we hear more and more about. Um, and then what they say is, okay, are there any differences, mutations, where in all of the relatives, it's one mutation or one variant, I should say, it's one uh, um, base pair, one base, one RNA base, mm-hmm. and but is but and it's the same. It's conserved among all of those non-SARS two, um, very closely related or as closely related as we've seen so far, um, coronaviruses. But then within SARS two, those hundred and eighty thousand plus genomes. The, the um, RNA has changed, the letter has changed, and this change is an amino acid. It's a non-synonymous change. And that's conserved now in the entire 182,000, right? So this would be this that those early days, those spillover days. And you kind of, an idea would be you needed to make this change uh, in order as part of that process of spilling over, of being able to replicate in a new species, in this case, our own species as humans, as we continue to grapple with the, the global pandemic. So that change could have happened just before entry into a human or early on in the first infections, right? Yeah, I think that's right. And you, and it's a really good point, which is to be a little um, you know, cautious with trying to over-interpret um, the exact timing of something yeah. like that, or that it's just a single event that's going on here, right? They have seven regions. Um, uh, four of which are not even in the spike gene, which I think, as yeah. we've discussed, gets a lot of attention and sometimes probably too much attention. Um, and so, but anyway, so this is um, amino acid position 372 in the spike gene. And the mutation is from a threonine amino acid to an alanine amino mm-hmm. acid. So all, all of the relatives of um, SARS-2 have a threonine. All of SARS-2 have an alanine at this position in the spike. So the human isolates all have alanine. Is that what you're saying? I am. Yep. Okay. That's what they. So, that's what so, they discovered. Yep. So nature is doing an alanine scanning on nails. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. This is this classic uh, <laughs> trick of biochemistry where you have a whole like set of sequence that you want to experimentally disrupt. You put in alanines, and so. Yeah. It, it looks like, um, but remember, so there's perfectly good working viruses that have threonine at that position. It's right. just that, and, and it is pretty striking that all SARS-2 have alanine. I am curious. They don't say this. It's a little, and this would be my next sort of part of podcast peer review is, you know, what's the context here? How rare is that actually, that there's um, a residue that's exclusively one thing in SARS-2 and exclusively something else? Mm-hmm. in the rest of coronavirus or you know related coronaviruses sarbecoviruses um and at least to do that maybe for those seven regions they propose why is it that we've focused exactly on this one out of you know i just want to know i guess the how rare yeah, is it to I find agree. something like this right yeah and so i think yeah, you know I mean, that it, would it, i mean they they just notably ignore everything else but spike right <laughs> which i think <laughs> well, is yeah. fair but no, it, that's it's right. okay we can use we can use okay. spike as an yep. example to illustrate this process, I think that's their their idea here. But if you looked at every, so is the idea here now is that within Spike alone, say, mm. this is the only constant amino acid among these viruses that they've compared? Well, no. So there's tons of constant amino acids. There's all kinds of what we would call purifying selection mm-hmm. on the overall population. The you know the tr- interesting thing here is that. It's different in it's it's sort of uh, completely different in the non-human related um, coronaviruses, and so I do, and, and what I don't know is how um, frequent you see that pattern, and so okay. that would be kind of interesting. So you know, so they're putting together two things. One is that scan of regions where it looks like there could have been something like a sweep, and then looking for what might be what you might be sweeping on by doing this um, uh, uh, sort of complementary okay. analysis. But that's, you know, it's a, it's kind of an ad hoc approach. It's great. I think it's clever, but it's just, I think because you're doing this ad hoc approach for the first time, you would really like to see a little bit of that context of how, you know, how, how much, um, you know, attention should I put to this? So they certainly put some attention to this. So they next map, um, there's great structures now, great structural biology around SARS-2 again, this massive, um, effort from, by many labs, um, kind of coming together 
in the last year or so. And um, and so they can very quickly, once you sort of identify what you think might be an interesting uh, mutation, put that on to the protein structure. And you could even, you know, start to make some, so, you know, generate some hypotheses. What, why is it or how, why could it be that that alanine scanning, that alanine scan that you did, na that nature did, could have an impact? And so, you know, maybe they're almost a little disappointed at first because it doesn't line up right into the kind of the interaction zone between the spike protein, the ACE2 receptor mm -hmm. um, that it recognizes. <laughs> and so then you're left, uh, well, hold on now. You're kind of scratching your head. So they do some predictions. So um, by making that alanine change that you can, you know, it's more than just protein here. These proteins are also glycosylated. They decorate themselves with sugars. Yeah. And so, um, you know, they make some predictions. Well, actually, if you make that change, some of those algorithms say, oh, that might change a glycosyl group here or there. And so, Again, sort of, you know, you're getting a little bit out on a limb, uh, a hypothesis limb with a prediction without so much evidence supporting it. But yeah, this yeah. idea that maybe you took, a, if, if that's true, that that mm -hmm. could ch somehow change the interaction between spike and ACE2 from the, um, you know, ancestral animal population, but then made it better in its um, attempt to uh, replicate in, in recognize and replicate in human cells. And we should note, Nels, that this is a position, uh, 372, has not gotten any press before this, right? <laughs> no, that's right. I love this. So that's why I kind of wanted to um, <laughs> do some off-roading here <laughs> with this one, because, we, you know, we have, as we've, <laughs> excuse me, as we've discussed, we have a little bit of variant fever these days where we see we're doing so much sequencing. I mean, and actually, we should be doing more, depending on the, um, you know, levels of surveillance that um, you would recommend from a public health standpoint, but still right. totally unprecedented in the fact that you can just dial up, you know, nearly 200,000, um, se genomic sequences from SARS-2 that's been sampled in the last year. Amazing. And so, yeah. And so, and it's become, you know, kind of a science sport of, um, going around and saying, oh, we've got this very, you know, I just saw these breathless headlines even yesterday yeah. that there's yeah. a variant <laughs> in California and that it might have even recombined with another or two lineages might have had a recombination event. And now they're proposing that this is sort of the the next sort of, you know, um, situation that will sweep through. The issue here that a lot of people rightly raised is, um, you know, so this has been reported now in newspapers, but the um, the preprint or, you know, certainly not a peer reviewed publication, but even the preprint is only promised. It hasn't been put out there. And so. I think as a community, we're left a little bit skeptical, a little um, pissed off, frankly, in some corners that we can't like show the data. If you're going to go on record and make sort of some high profile claims, um, you really need to to get that on the record, um, not sort of just kick that down the road a little bit. Um, anyway, so now, let, let's clarify one question here. Yes. From Robert. Did I understand this right? One amino acid substitution possibly enables the host change from bat to human. Yeah, so I wouldn't. So that's one of the author's claims, um, at least by the title, right? So um, a selective sweep has driven uh, human adaptation. They're a little less specific than that, right? So just that there's this process of there's, and I think this is um, on firm ground, obviously, that um, SARS 2 is new to our species in the last year and a half or so, plus mm -hmm. or minus. Um, and so then that's the idea is that there have been um, some, uh, you know, probably not just a single amino acid substitution, but several, uh, some collection of them that have contributed to that process. And if there are ones that were really consequential, that were important, that you'd be able to um, potentially identify those. Um, and and so that's what the authors are after here. And so I don't think that they would claim, uh, and certainly I wouldn't be comfortable saying that this is it, yeah, this yeah. is the one, but um, that, but I think it's worth um, chewing on for a while into, is in, um, and, and beyond this preprint, actually, whether this position 372 and this substitution um, might have had a hand in that spillover um, event, which is obviously massively consequential. I'm um, sure there for, are more there are more changes that are important. This may be one of multiple ones, and and there are certainly ones in other genes as well, right? Yeah, exactly. And so that's why you know of the seven regions they propose, and again, kind of with a grain of salt for any tool that's uh, that's um, pushing through the genomes. 
um, you know, a little bit of that context. Are there other cases where you see all of the related viruses have one substitution or one mutation and all of the SARS-2 have another? But that is like, that's, it's, it's pretty interesting. Also, you know, a little bit um, worth it to consider, um, you know, the data set itself. So those 182,000 sequences aren't just randomly sampled. And so yeah, yeah. Um, there's some that are, you know, it's your, this isn't like marbles out of the bag. This is, there were some sequencing efforts that were really advanced and they were kind of churning through getting good um, sequences and immediately depositing them in this um, resource. A lot of highly related sequences from some of the, you know, yeah. sources that yeah. were in on the ground floor. Some um, mixed sequences of uh, lower quality. There are some um, cutoffs and filters that are put into the um, GISAID data, but there are differences there, but it's not a, a random sampling. And so, you know, that would be another um, kind of podcast peer review moment is to do some curation actually, instead of, so in, in the authors that rightly say, you know, this is an incredible, like unprecedented resource to have that many sequences. Um, but I think you, because you have so many uh, more than you probably need to even tease out some of these signals of sweeps. Mm -hmm. um, I mm -hmm. would be tempted to spend some time curating that so that I felt like I had a, a balanced phylogenetic dis distribution as much as I could, or at the very least doing some back checks, you know, or some, um, you know, taking one, uh, almost a bootstrapping approach where you take one set of sequences or another, and then see if your algorithm still predicts the same sites. Is there a real signal here? How robust is your data? I think there could be some, you know, some improvements um, in that area before we get too far out on a limb that this is sort of one of the really massive changes. Um, now, to the author's credit, they do go back now when, that they identify this and they don't just sort of, I mean, that's what we would all do is map. It's very quick. You can very quickly look at the crystal structure, make predictions, run it through another program. But they go ahead and they actually engineer that mutation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, so, and good for them. So into um, one of the early strains this is um so they make the rever what they you would call the revertant mutant um mm -hmm. so you know today it's an alanine at position 372 in the spike gene of all SARS 2 they say what if we make that back to a threonine um sort of mimicking what it, what they're what we're inferring that it looked like g given that all related viruses have a threonine at that location what it looked like before it spilled over and then mm -hmm. ask how does that virus do for example in human cells so I think they made a good decision. They took a virus to do this. You have to pick your backbone virus. And what would have been, you know, potentially a disaster is picking one that just showed up, uh, you know, last week or something like that. And the reason for that is there's been a year's worth of in inhuman um, uh, explorations of mutations, sequence diversification, um, in some cases, certainly even some probably um, mild adaptations. And so um, instead they pick a, a, a sequence um, or a genome that was first reported back in 2019 from Wuhan. I think the um, mm -hmm. collected sort of locally in Wuhan and then analyzed or sequenced in the Wuhan Institute for Virology um, from uh, uh, 2019. And so um, th that's a good, wise choice, I think. Actually, you'd want to get the most, you know, like the very first virus that we yeah. detected because this thing is making those multiple changes. And then anytime you make a change, it's actually a little bit out of context from what sure. the what the ancestral so virus actually this, looked like. This, the, this is the first isolate, so that would be, in theory, the closest to the spillover event, right? That's right. And But that's another gray area. And so, um, and that would be another caveat, I think, to their to their results. But let's talk about the results first. So what they di did then, after they launched that virus, and then they do some of the root now somewhat routine, I say that like it's easy to work with SARS-2 at BSL-3, but um, uh, routine cell infection assays, so they infect uh, vervet monkey cells, maybe, and then more importantly, infect uh, human cells. It's, oh yeah, here, this is great, Vincent. Thanks for for pulling it up. So now in, let's walk through the kind of main figure here. So panel A, that's showing us a little cartoon of the spike gene, that one um, mutation. So you have that threonine encoded by the codon ACA, the, the red A, and that A became a G, GCA, which now encodes alanine. Mm. Um, the amino acid as we're translating the spike protein. Um, panel B is showing um, plaques mm -hmm. um, from the virus. And here they bring in another, I think this was a, a good call that for a little bit of context. They brought in another uh, mutation in the spike that we've talked about on the show that uh, has gained uh, back in the spring, early summer, gained a ton of attention. This is the D uh, 
614 to glycine mutation, um, which uh, did sweep um, through many um, of the, um, you know, it became sort of a predominant virus. Um, wasn't sort of, I think there was a, a lot of worry that this was, would be sort of a game changer, um, perhaps in terms of um, virulence, other kind of impact, um, right, and ended right. up kind of landing a little bit with a thud, but but is, um, you know, a variant of note. Um, and then comparing that now to the T372 to alanine. Um, and so here in the, just these plaque assays, um, have to remind everyone, Vincent's favorite <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm fond of it too. Like, let's look at the plaques. This is this is the virus, the way that you quantify the breakthrough um, approach to do virology. Um, and what we're looking at at the top row is, you know, roughly how many plaques do you get? And th this is quantified below, and we'll step through this in a moment. But, um, you know, even at this, um, these two dilutions, um, so um, on the bottom row, more virus on the top row, fewer virus particles just because you've diluted, I assume, tenfold. Um, you can see there's a little bit more in D614G uh, compared to wild type or T372A. And now remember, so this is a revertant experiment. And so what they're, what one prediction might be that the virus was worse at replicating in human cells until it, until it got the threonine, the threonine. That's right. Exactly. Um, and so, um, uh, and so that's the, the question is sort of the reverse. It, not that the virus get better, but if we revert back, does the virus do worse? Yeah. And so that's what we're looking at at panels C and D. Um, and the uh, not well labeled, but I think I can remember this. So in panel C, that's when, the, the, so these are um, infections of vervet cells. Um, yes, C is vervet, right? Yep, and then D, although, I believe. Although we don't know, we don't know what the colors are. They forgot to put the color in the legend. <laughs> <laughs> they did. They forgot the color, but I think we can assume. But you can actually, if you read the text, you can assume, I think, pretty easily, um, that the black color is wild, is wild type or the um, wow. background strain, the Wuhan okay. strain that they're using. The red is D six one four G, okay, and the t and the um, green or teal or whatever that is is T three seventy two A. Okay. Um, okay. And so what you see is um, actually, so T, so it's the alanine is the modern, but if you revert it to the, um, or maybe I'm getting, maybe I'm reversing this. If you have the alanine there, the virus does worse. Right. So, so that actually, and you can see that actually both in panel C in the old world monkey cells from vervets. And you can see that in panel D, these are human, I think, lung yeah. epithelial cells that they're using. Right. Um, and so, um, you know, consistent with some other data, the uh, 614 mutation does a little better, um, yeah, but the alanine yeah. does worse. And so, you know, that's a nice, um, uh, I give them some credit for, first of all, for that's not a, a, a small amount of work, um, but we, we do have all of the usual caveats that this is a cell assay where yeah, you're, yeah. Um, you know, you're, me you're measuring virus replication, but a, a real life infection is, is so much more complicated and, and so many more variables at play. But, you know, at least I would say some um, functional evidence consistent with their hypothesis that the virus, um, by making that mutation that they're inferring as an adaptive sweep, a selective sweep, that that actually allows the virus to replicate better um, now up to the wild type. So it's, and it's actually from a um, bio, I have to say from a biosafety standpoint, the design of the experiment is really elegant because you don't make, you're not trying to make a super bug or a super virus where you're starting with the bat and saying, let's make this thing really good at infecting humans. You're doing the reverse. You're starting with the human virus and you're saying, what did it look, what did the ancestor look like? And, and was it worse then? And so that's actually, I think a nice part of the experimental design here. And also we, should point out that this is actually SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's not a pseudotype virus. It's virus that you have to work in a BSL-3 with, you know, a high containment facility. So this is good. Yeah. I'm really glad because, as they say, you know, if you just do a pseudotype, you don't really interrogate the entire reproductive cycle of the virus. You're just looking at entry, really, because the yeah. rest is, is uh, driven by other proteins. So this is good. But, you know, I, and I think it's interesting that they identify this residue, you know, by computational biology, and it mm. has some effect. But, you know, you could put other residues here. <laughs> it might have yes. some effect. And the problem is this, I mean, cells and culture, okay, 
the real issue is in people now, as we've talked yeah. about, because D614G, we yeah. have mainly data like this and we don't know what to do with it, right? Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, and that's where, you know, having a little more context. So the, I mean, the D614 adds some, but if you like, yeah, are there other yeah. residues like this or how, yeah, I think knowing that and, and then even seeing if you test one or two others. So, and why is it that we care that much about it? At least for me, you know, part of that is because, um, this isn't so uh, it's an attempt at getting to that virus that might've spilled over, but it still is a more modern virus. And because right. viruses, what do they do? They mutate, they make tons of changes. And so anytime you put this one change in, it's a little bit out of order. It's a little out of context. It's as close sure. as you can get. Sure. And I give you great credit, but it could be that the virus does worse just because there's one other substitution that actually is now incompatible with this substitution that you've kind of put in the pseudo ancient virus or pseudo ancestral virus that's a little more modern than that. And so it's a little bit vulnerable um, to some caveats and issues. But I have to say, I like the framing of the question. I like the idea of trying to tackle a little bit of that, uh, what was going on in that spillover event, because the, you know, by and large, the field is really chasing variants, new variants, um, kind of almost science tourism, trying to grab uh, what's the <laughs> next, you know, big mutation that's going to come on. And fortunately, this is kind of getting caught up some, you know, I'd say in some cases in the headlines and can kind of um, start to um, approach almost fear kind of mongering scenarios. And so, um, and don't get me wrong, absolutely 100% in favor of, if anything, more surveillance. Um, yes, there is a, sure. a, a really cool recent study from Von Cooper and a few others um, sampling now emerging viruses around the country and actually in finding a, a, a variant, a mutation that hadn't been on the radar so much uh, independently in seven different kind of uh, different locales, mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. locations. And, you know, using that um, sort of beacon of independent parallel evolution or convergent evolution to right. infer that there's something important here. And so all kinds of good work happening. Um, at the same time, fun to see some, some kind of reframing the question a little bit and, and thinking yeah. about that evolutionary event, the spillover, which is really, I would, for my money, you know, that's the biggest adaptive move we've been up against so far is when that virus somehow moved from an animal reservoir into us and then changed our lives in the last year. That's been, that to me, it has been, you know, the, the most, and then we're seeing ongoing adaptation, but this is a still, I think from all of the data um, that we're seeing so far, these are, this is more kind of tinkering with um, the, you know, the new landscape that the viruses are faced with, which is a host sure. population, which is gaining in natural immunity. And then now the real, you know, curveball that we've thrown back at the viruses is the vaccine as that becomes more and more deployed. And, you know, yeah. have to say, really feeling cautiously optimistic. Some of the early reports out of Israel, where um, they've now, I think, vaccinated north of 70% of the population of the country, right. um, at least in some communities, and the virus has sort of fallen off the shelf. Um, so, well, this so far, is so the good. Um, this is the key, right? The fewer people the virus is reproducing, and the fewer variants you're going to have, and that's why someone asked earlier, how, why mm. last year there were so few variants and now all of a sudden we have because we have huge numbers of people infected and that gives off huge numbers of variants now as the numbers drop we're going to have fewer and fewer variants i hope we get away from variant fever but I, mean, I do think <laughs> Nels is right we need to look for them for sure but yeah. um i think an interesting question is uh could we use this Nels, for other outbreaks hmm. we could do it now sars one we didn't have much sequence data Correct. right so yep, we that's right but for ebola outbreaks we have a lot of sequence data um we could use this approach to look for positively or sweeped uh, positions yeah. right yeah and there are more tools out there so that would be another um you know i think thing to consider is are these the right tools should we be developing more tools that might be kind of tailored or, or uh to this and so that's where some of our um friends in the fields of population genetics i think could weigh in um on what are, you know, what are the um, sort of, what's the power of, or yeah. of, of actually pulling out signal from noise um, in the changes that are in the proposed sweeps that are, that are being put out there. Now, we talked about a paper on Friday out of Linfa Wong's lab, where mm. they found new um, bat SARS, like SARS-CoV-2 like viruses. It would be interesting to see uh, if this is a, an alanine in those, right? <laughs> 
Yeah, agreed. Yep. Was that, did that include, um, are these some of the um, viruses that were pulled out of, I think, like samples in Cambodia, Thailand and the Thailand. other? Thailand. It was a, it was Thailand. a, okay. it was a yep. pipe in Thailand and they hmm. got, they had a colony of 300 bats there and they sampled a hundred and there's one predominant uh, circulating SARS-CoV-2 like virus and uh, the sequence is out there. We, we could look to see, I'll bet if these yeah. guys are right, it's going to be an alanine, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. And so that's, that's, um, that's the potentially, so if this holds up, you know, and I think it's a great hypothesis actually, and it's well-framed and there's more to do, but if that holds up, then you can imagine, and if there's something to that, and depending on how many routes are available to coronaviruses, um, like SARS-2 to, to make that adapt like that now, as we increase our monitoring, you know, you might have a handful of mutations like this one where you'd say, Oh yeah, this one, you're right. This one, we've got a three in here. Um, caution. We could be, and you could start to even think about getting into forecasting under a best case scenario. Now that's, you know, I'm out on a limb on that one because, um, <laughs> <laughs> lots of different mutational paths possible. Um, again, the context of the rest of the genome really matters, but, um, I think it's worth it to kind of pursue these ideas, especially if we, if you can kind of validate and get high confidence and start to see patterns again. So if that yeah. pattern, so yeah. there's no, there's no convergent evolution here because it's like everyone so far of SARS-2 has this mutation. Right. Right. We started um, out early on. Yeah. 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 And now you have the three and but, um, and that's, you know, and that's the prediction or that's the whole idea is that it started, it was yeah. super rare, but then, then it swept the entire population so that now everyone has that, including all the variants, by the way, um, that have yeah. Uh, yeah. come up in different lineages. Yeah, exactly. So now, it's sort of rear. Yeah. I really would like to see these other areas. You know, they have seven areas total and they just focused <laughs> on this one, but they, I think yeah. we need to look at those too. Right. No, I'm with you. And honestly, you know, so if you, um, one of the earlier figures kind of has a, you go along the genome and then the algorithm has sort of a like statistical support for what it right, predicts as right. regions. And so it's the top seven. And if you really, it's not at high res still. And again, you know, preprint, preprint, um, peer review here, podcast peer review. Um, <laughs> but, um, so the Omega plus tool, you can see these little peaks and I think they're colored in purple. The second tool um, the raised tool is in yellow and it's just kind of wigg wiggling around. So I didn't, wasn't convinced uh, that yeah, that tool yeah. added very much signal to the situation there. And yet it's still kind of, you know, they say, I think they kind of combine the two algorithms to then propose or to, um, you know, to prioritize those top right. seven right. regions of the genome. And so that's, yeah, that's where it gets, as you kind of dig into it, um, you, you would like to see. Here's a, a good one, uh, Nels. Could this change? be conserved in other hosts like cats and mink, or would similar changes be needed to cross from humans to animals? It's a good question, right? Are these, do we Great know if question. they looked at the mink sequences, uh, Nels, in this paper? Yeah, they didn't. And I no, I like the way you're thinking about this, Andrew, which is, um, uh, at, you know, let's not just think about our own species, but other species and um, exactly pets, um, minks, the mink farms. This has been a local issue actually in Utah. There are some um, massive mink farms that have been um, increasingly, they've been culling the, their entire farms because of the um, spillovers that can, the, the knock on spillovers. And so there, you know, I think a little bit about some of the great work on parvoviruses um, and that use a different receptor, not ACE2. They use the transferrin receptor. And um, you, and Colin Parrish in particular has done this incredible kind of journey of comparisons between different species, their transferrin receptors, and then the, um, you know, sort of the equivalent of the spike protein from parvovirus and how that's changed. And you can really almost line this up from raccoon to dog to cat. And so that, I think that's, a, that would be a great approach here as well you know, mm. to start to mm. see if there's, and, and that might give at least some complementary evidence that that really is a, a location in the spike that could be um, kind of helping dictate um, species specificity or, or spillover potential in some ways. Yeah. All right. So that's our kind of main event. But then um, I think a good idea for us to return to kind of an update on what's happening with the, um, you know, sort of a lot of the variants that um, have been in the news. The uh, um, We've had uh, many discussions in, our, in the last two episodes of Twivo on Twiv. This has been uh, kind of at, uh, a big part of the conversation is how do we think about things like these lineages like B117 um, that swept through in the UK, um, some similar patterns in Denmark, How what, what's happening um, kind of as this is spreading 
um, around the world. And so actually, before we go too far into this, we've, we've been, you and I have been, um, you know, we kind of continue to look at the Grinch tool. Um, this is coming out of Andrew Rambeau's lab and a great grad student there whose name I've been, um, my Gaelic is awful, but one of our listeners kindly <laughs> helped hopefully get me closer to a cor correct pronunciation. So this is Anya O'Toole. Um, who's put this together. And again, this is so kind of scraping as new um, coronaviruses are deposited at GISAID and um, I think is the main repository that she's scraping from and then putting them on the map. So are these, um, you know, are are we seeing, are we observing more and more the spread um, and potentially, you know, sweeps um, of lineages um, uh, as they are, um, you know, showing up in different okay. populations. And so, so here's, uh, here's lineages of rent. concern. Yep. Here's the Grinch, and we can, you can see they they're tracking B one one seven, B one three five one, and P one. Right, just those that's three. That's right. And so remind me, so uh, one seventeen, that's the one that was first identified in the United Kingdom. Yeah. Um, right. Three fifty one, is that the South, uh, yep. the one that was first um, kind of came on the radar in South Africa. Correct. And then P one, I believe, is um, the one that um, and you can actually see it in that map in Brazil, Brazil. with with the dark color where right. it's um, kind of come to come up. In and they numbers have some there. Uh, they have some others here, lineage of of note A two three one and B one five two five. Let's take a look at these and see um, what a a. Let's see this one. Mm -hmm. Um, well, it just it tells you for each one where they are. I, I don't know where uh, first detected in Uganda. A two three one is in Uganda mm. now. See, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the other one is B one five two five. First detected in multiple countries, mm -hmm. uh, but for each one it tells you where there are now. Right, so this one first detected in multiple now is in you know fifty nine yeah. times it's been picked up in Denmark, fifty seven times, um, and yep. so forth. By the way, it's Nels, also, the Celtic yeah. Tiger says it was a good pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's generous. I'm whew, doing what I can over here. Um, and I appreciate, I can't remember who sent us, actually a really nice note, not only on that pronunciation, but on some other issues. And so, um, no, this is really great. And, and Anya is also included in there, um, you know, what are the defining SNPs? What are the, what is that variation? And I think sometimes that gets lost in the conversation, right? So we've spent the last... Yeah half hour or so really digging in on one location, one amino acid position 372 in the spike. And so these lineages also have so have what are now being described as our defining SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, and that's important because, you know, as again, this notion of convergent evolution, um, and this is happening where you see, you know, a handful of some of these SNPs or mutations coming up in independently in different populations. And those are ones that we might, you know, there's uh, viruses mutate so much that um, some of these mutations, um, uh, in addition to the ones that are sort of defining, will just be kind of coming along for the ride. Um, but the ones we're interested in are ones that might be having some functional, yeah. you know, consequences, some impact. And so, Here's, uh, um, Here's her defining SNPs here for yeah. B117, yep. for example. Yeah. And then yep. she's got graphs, cumulative sequence count. Um, you know, part of the problem with this, Nels, is that not every country has equal genomics surveillance, right? No, that's right. And big grain of salt. So this is just counts. This isn't, I mean, and then you would take data like this, or, you know, uh, I think maybe more incisively take the data from a certain location and then put that through. Um, the paces of sort of more rigorous statistical analysis. But this kind of gives, I think what this is valuable for is an overview. So obviously, if all of a sudden B117 just went to town in the US, the, it, even in the sort of wholesale surveillance, you would just absolutely spike, or spike's the wrong word, uh, but uh, you'd, <laughs> <laughs> you, would, uh, you would see it sort of dominate. Um, so you can, I think you can, at least in really broad, rough outlines, see major patterns. But I think it's worth it to put this in a little context and remember that, you know, I think the prevailing energy when it comes to how SARS-2 is doing is that it's not doing so great. It was mm -hmm. doing spectacularly well as a transmitting virus um, across the new year, over the holidays and through the new year. Um, but even in the last few weeks, um, it is starting to to fall off, well, which is really- Yeah, everyth everything is falling off now, right, Nels? 
That's right. And so that actually makes it, that makes it harder to, um, especially yeah. for the novices, the epidemiologic novice like myself to, <laughs> to interpret this sort of rough data. I saw someone was, um, looking at, I think it was in some of and still in the UK at some of the numbers in some of the, um, local regions there at B117 and noting that it was plateauing, um, and saying, Oh, wait a minute, maybe this thing isn't, um, you know, as advertised going to start to dominate the population. Um, but yeah. then someone yeah. noted, you know, in a kind of a reply, this is all my kind of Twitter, um, just sort of, uh, you know, hiding in the shadows and watching the conversations unfold in, in real time. Someone noted this epidemiologic um, phenomenon called Simpson's paradox, mm -hmm. which is when your entire population of viruses or infectious microbes or um, is parasites, whatever it is, is starting to fall, like the whole thing is starting to fall, then even the ones that are gaining will start to look like they're plateauing just because of the way of the course, numbers are playing out, right? Yeah. yeah. And so... So that's, I think that's kind of an important new part of the conversation since the last time we spoke is just, um, you know, how the numbers are falling and what combination of natural immunity, um, what combination of vaccine enhanced immunity is continuing to come online, the seasonality of the virus. And then, you know, has some of the public health messaging, is that finally starting to resonate, especially as we were really kind of accelerating in cases over the holidays, are we really hunkering down um, uh, more so as a, and kind of from a population level um, through the winter in the hopes that we're kind of going to turn the corner on this thing? So now this is a good graph here. Frequency of, say, B117 produced since first new variant reported, right? Yeah. And this is what I've always said. Here's the U.S., which is all the way down here, mm -hmm. right? Um, if, th if this virus were more transmissible, right, which was the original claim. It should take off in the U.S., but it, it clearly hasn't. Now it, it took off in the U.K., clearly. But yep. something else is think, going on. And it, it you know, <laughs> as I've said before, it's probably a matter yeah. of fitness, which can be context-dependent. It can depend on the population and what other viruses are circulating and so forth. Yeah, there's a there's a lot going on. I think it also, B117, um, kind of rose pretty convincingly uh, in Denmark. Um, independently mm -hmm. from the UK. Um, there, is, I think at least in some localities in the US, I think I read or saw some data indicating that um, it might be doubling um, in, in terms of the frequency, uh, you know, compared to the other um, genotypes or the other variants out there, it might be doubling every 10 days in some right. locations that are being sampled. But, but I think that's, you know, for, uh, again, for an epidemiologist, like that's massively consequential. I think for um, the virologist, the public health enthusiast, just the citizen of the world, um, the over the prevailing patterns of this thing falling off is is where you know that's really a big deal that we're yeah. uh, now it is, and I've seen some uh, modeling, some projections that depending on what kind of goes on in that combination yeah. of of vaccine rollouts and um, public health behaviors, masks, social distancing, et cetera, that, um, you, you know, you can model where with the pace that B117 is starting to come to dominate some lo local locations that you can, you start to see this down curve and then it starts to like a little bit of a ski jump. It starts mm -hmm. to come up in March, April, May. But I, th again, you know, I think, uh, at least for me, I've been pretty surprised in a good way for how just across the board, numbers are coming down. And then that could be, you know, the, I think the best case scenario, it's almost this virtuous cycle where the virus populations are now smaller. The, um, they're not transmitting as easily. They're not sampling as many new mutations um, that could lead to something, a, a ma you know, a very rare event that could, um, you know, sort of escape some of the immune measures and related um, measures in place. I think overall, another... I think it's, yeah, go Another issue here with these variants is that many of them have changes that impact antibody neutralization, and that gives them a selective advantage now, whereas earlier in the outbreak, there was very little population immunity. And so if you introduce this, if this variant comes into a relatively immune population, it's going to have a fitness advantage, right? So yeah, all these right. things are coming into play. And that's why, you know, the idea of that it's 
going from person to person in the air better is not is not really the right approach. It's moving through the population, and I'm not sure we will ever find yeah. out why, Nels, because this <laughs> is, seems to be I coming agree. to an end, which is good. <laughs> I, think, but... I, I hope so. I don't want to do the experiment. Yeah, this is the one where I don't want to do the experiment. But I think, but I, I, you know, I think you're making a really important point, Vincent, which is, you know, the way we frame this, I think, is really important. And for me, this has been a little bit missing from the main conversation because, and it's almost just very natural to see a new variant and, and then, and, and you know, be concerned. These are variants of concern, mm -hmm. but it's all, but I think where we haven't really quite framed it properly is it's a lot harder. So that original virus that spilled over that we were talking about kind of at the top of the show, it's a lot harder for that one to replicate today. Right. And so, um, the, yeah. the bar has moved and this is exactly your point. The bar has moved on what it means to be a SARS two, um, replicating in a human population. It's not naive. It's not as easy because the populations aren't as naive, both from a immunological standpoint and from a behavioral standpoint. And so it's for the virus. It's almost all the, the mutation that back to the red queen idea. Maybe I'll, I'll try it all the running you can do to stay in the same place. Um, yeah, you know, but yeah. even with all that running, it appears that SARS two is falling behind. And so I think that a little bit, of that bigger picture has been in some conversations a little bit, um, in the background here. Well, I, I agree. The big picture is what I like to take. And I think that people don't, they, they just get scared and they want to, you know, say, oh, we have to be careful. But the, look at the big picture because how is this moving in the general sense? And then if you look, you think about it, it's not so, it's not so straightforward. There are a lot of uh, nuances there. Um, it's complicated. You know, yep. see, now is the part of the problem is many people email me and say, do I now have to wear five masks to stop the variant? And no, that's not what we're saying. You know, having yeah. better fitness doesn't mean it goes through a mask. It goes through a population better, and it may not take very much of a fitness advantage, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, yep. maybe less than a log advantage in cell culture. Maybe that's enough to push a virus through. And really, the effect on people is is the same. Yeah. Well, and you, you raise another really important point here, Vincent, which is that there's sort of biology unfolding on the level of the individual. Um, mm -hmm. You and me, our friends, our family. And of course, that's the top of our mind. But then there's virus dynamics and population dynamics that are happening on a population level where actually the individual sort of gets pushed to the side. And you yeah, really yeah. think about the patterns and those things. And that's where most of the um, epidemiology is happening and being discussed. But I think we, there might be in that conversation a little bit of a disconnect from uh, an outsider, someone even in, you know, with a scientific training, but maybe outside of epidemiology, um, we very naturally think about kind of what does this mean kind of on an individual level when a lot of the work is being done at a, a, a different, at a population level. It's a different way of, uh, again, framing or, or working through how patterns impact, I mean, ultimately an individual, but that's a yeah. It's a different cover. It's a it's a complicated conversation to have, and we're certainly learning as we go. But um, my goodness, I'm just happy every day to see the um, as those trend lines are going down. Like, let's not do the experiment. Let's continue to hunker down. Uh, I can um, you know commit today that I will not shave this beard until we're through this thing one way yeah. or another oh boy <laughs> well i won't i might trim it but depending on where we are but uh you know as once we're all vaccinated <laughs> and it's and it's more of a nuisance than a every day and also now as we can uh, we can get back to some other twivo topics right oh exactly so one of the good things is you know science hasn't stopped um certainly our a lot of our eyes our attention for good reasons has been moved to this but there's uh, all kinds of incredible evolutionary genetics, evolutionary science across the board that is just bubbling up and percolating and is it will be on our menu on Twivos ahead. But good reason to to grapple with these um, issues. Yeah. And and as you said at the top of the show, Vincent, you know, we're a lot of the data is just coming online. We'll be crunching this and learning from it for years for sure. to come. Yep. No, I, I the big picture is important. I want to know you know, as this virus moves, a brand new virus moves through a population, what changes are selected for and what do they do? And so far we don't have answers because you can't make, you can't get answers from correlations. You can't see numbers go up and say, oh, here's the variant must be causing it. That's an, that's an association. It's not a causation, but those, yeah. and unfortunately we, we will never have an answer because we, the human is the only place where you can, uh, can get that, and the answer is so we'll have to do make do with cell cultures and animals. 
Yeah. And then kind of trying to put the, build that circumstantial case, right? Do the associations yes. hold up? Do the inferences from phylogenetic analysis or related, like, do those inferences hold up? Um, kind of attacking it with multiple different lines, you know, the, the uh, mapping it onto the structure, uh, maybe, you know, uh, th that generated another hy hypothesis. Is there really a glycosylation difference that could be measured? Or could it be some allosteric? If you did some, you know, started to do some um, high level uh, structural biology, you might see some um, features or differences in the protein structure as an outcome of certain mutations or not. And so, you, yeah, and then, and then, you know, as you mix that with the animal studies or even the cell studies, but the caveats there, um, I think the best case scenario is, is that you just sort of build that circumstantial evidence um, in complementary ways. And then that's, is, and, but you're right, you'll never, you know, it's an experiment you don't want to do, which is um, to literally experiment with humans when it comes to um, these kind of um, outcomes or in kind of, you know, purposeful um, infection protocols, which is just not ethically even on the menu. So yep. now uh, people are saying you're going to look like ZZ Top, you know? <laughs> well, we'll see. Um, so we'll folks, if you want Nails to do another live stream, give us some likes. Go down below the video and hit the <laughs> like button uh, and make Nails happy. Um, this is a good question here, Nails. Could there be a huge uncounted mm. population of asymptomatics accounting for herd immunity? Yeah, so this, that's right. You know, so we're looking, I think, at least I am as a, um, you know, um, not an epidemiologist, but I'm looking at kind of scratching my head. Like, what is it really? I was kind of bracing um, as we were talking December, January you know, are, are the number as, and as we were seeing those accelerating trend lines, is this just going to continue to go? Um, and so, you know, I think it's in, at least from my reading in this, it's a great question, you know, is there, are we underestimating the amount of natural immunity out there? And, and there are, you know, deliberate studies to tackle this, to do random sampling of people. Yeah. Um, right. And, and, I think the answer is that we probably are. So it is underreported because it's asymptomatic. There's just like a, a huge population of people who are probably infected and just didn't get ever or still haven't been tested. And they just don't, and, the, and they don't know that. Um, but, um, you know, that's probably not like the whole explanation, though, um, because because of some of those randomized studies that, you know, kind of allows you to infer a number of unreported cases um, and sort of a bigger pool of natural immunity. But it's still um, probably not close to that level of just natural herd immunity. And even in countries that have kind of let go, I think we had a um, listener in Sweden where it's been um, a bit of a mixed bag in terms of uh, some of the public health um, approaches there. Um, you know, there have been some recent spikes in Sweden, even though you kind of opened the barn door, so to speak, um, back in uh, early days of SARS-2 and allowed the virus, um, you know, to 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 hit that population, certainly compared to the neighbors, um, Scandinavian neighbors places like Norway, Denmark, et cetera. And I'm not trying to also, um, you know, whatever, hold a heavy hand here to any country. I'm in the U S of course, where <laughs> our, um, our response and, um, track record has been mixed and spotty to say the least. But, um, yeah, so I think, uh, natural immunity is part of what we're seeing now. I've also, I think, I think there's a convincing case to be made for, uh, again, a, a complex combo of that seasonality and even, you know, in, at least in some communities, um, an uptick in vaccine enhanced supercharged immunity yeah. Yeah. Um, w where we really have the best chance here, I think, of an inflection point in the, in the next several months ahead or the next few months as we go. That's one of the data points I want to see in, you know, the next year. Um how much population uh, seropositivity there is. That'll give us an, an, an idea of the extent to which, you know, we haven't uh, measured the number of infections. Like Paul Offit last week said he mm. thinks we're fourfold or so uh, underestimating, but it could be even more. You know? Yeah. In which case, the, and there is, yeah, I, I think there's, there's definitely something to that, the natural immunity. I think another interesting question is, um, what happens now, even in, um, you know, depending on the vaccine that you receive, um, and very clear that um, we're massively successful in eliminating deaths and serious disease, but is there still kind of a foothold of the, you could still um, maybe get and transmit the virus, um, which is why there's still public health recommendations to continue like mask wearing, social distancing, especially in these early days. But I think that'll be an interesting part of the conversation too, is sort of the, we already, I think we're seeing people who've 
had SARS-2 and then get vaccinated, I think the latest recommendations are just one vaccine. You're almost boosting from your natural um, uh, immunity. But then the reverse of that, you get the vaccine boosted immunity. And then is there sort of a natural hiccup on the backside of that? And I think that will depend on you know the type of vaccine and where the immune system is um, uh, sort of hitting the or colliding with the virus populations, whether it's more in the lungs or in the nasal cavity or, or in the, you know, in the sinuses and how that kind of influences the dynamic. So it's, I mean, in that sense, again, yeah. we're back right into a, a massive uncontrolled experiment as the virus populations continue to, to move through humans. This is one of the biggest experiments we could do is the biggest pandemic since, well, you know, in a short period of time, you know, the HIV AIDS pandemic is bigger, mm. but that's, that's evolved mm -hmm. since 1980 and before, but this is the biggest one in a year. And so amazing yep. opportunity to look at data and that's going to be happening for many years. Absolutely. Yep. But Nels, what do you want to do? You want to take a few emails? Let's do that. Let's hit the mailbag. Um, should I take this first one from yes, Georgia? Please. Yeah, sounds good. So she writes, hi, Nels and Vincent. Just listen to episode number 64 for the second time in 24 hours. Well, first of all, Georgia, thanks for your patience there. That's like <laughs> a, a gift to, and um, uh, some real perseverance. Uh, so good. In the episode, you touched on something I've been thinking about. I don't have a science background, but I appreciate the scientific method and the approach to truth as evidence-based uh, point in time. That is, that is to say, varying degrees of certainty and always open to new evidence and reevaluation. I'm not certain if I understood you correctly about the B117 variant. My thinking has been that it is unlikely that all of the worldwide examples of the B117 variant are based upon a single original event, um, then transmitted by infected travelers, but rather multiple spontaneous originations that persisted in multiple places because it uh, apparently is more transmissible. I've thought that with the millions of people who've been infected by SARS-CoV-2, um, the billions or trillions of uh, replications the virus has undergone, the inevitable small number of errors per replication are bound, um, of, or the errors are bound eventually to be repeated randomly. Uh, and if they provide an advantage in transmission, would be found more often over time. Am I understanding this correctly? Thank you for all you do, Georgia. Well, thank you, Georgia. It's a, a really great letter. And um, yeah, so the I think it's worth it. So um, I think your intuition is really good here. Um, but a, this kind of almost, you know, also relates to how we describe or define these things. So that lineage B117, or to be even more accurate, B117, um, that we've already discussed even on today's episode. Um, you know, so it's, it's uh, and we've talked about the mutations or the uh, kind of defining mutations. And so um, here, that's a, it's a pretty, um, and there needs to be something like six, I think, defining mutations out of 17 or something, or out of 20 or somewhere in that, that ballpark for it to be considered B117. Um, but then there's this, and you're, you're right. So there's so many virus replications and enough um, selection, it appears, that you have conversion evolution, some of the same mutations showing up. Um, but those are, you know, we wouldn't call those necessarily B1.1.7. We'd call it, you know, another lineage. Um, and they would have overlapping set of mutations. And so there's been some move, um, and it's still kind of, um, you know, I think being litigated in real time, is to instead of thinking about the lineages that all, um, you know, are uh, hail from a common mm -hmm. ancestor during the, during at some point in the pandemic in the last year, to instead try to focus on those mutations and the uh, ones that matter. But there, there, and we've talked about this, the hard part is how do we know which ones really matter? Because as Vincent, I think, has outlined really well and clearly, easier said than done. And so we're kind of caught in this middle ground. Um, so the answer is, um, you know, that there is, and there is real um, traveler-based transmission. And in fact, when you hear about B117 in the US, for example, um, those events were likely seeded um, through uh, uh, travel, uh, travel exposure. Um, you know, someone goes to the UK, um, gets infected, flies back to the US. Someone from the U UK comes to the US, transmits in in the US, and then goes back to the UK, <clears throat> or different countries, or different. You know, you know, it can get it can get very complicated um, very quickly. But so when someone describes it as B117, 
um, the idea would be that there's still enough of a trace of that lineage with new changes on top of that, but enough of those defining ones that it came from that original single event. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to just put up this comment from JM who says, um, Christian Drosten mentioned in his last podcast, they currently test uh, 117 versus wild type in the lab, but until now did not find evidence for higher infectivity. So I'm not surprised, you know. Um, yeah. That's not the only way that a virus would have a fitness advantage by having higher infectivity. It could be other properties of the virus, right, Nels? Yeah, absolutely right. And that's where it, again, gets really hard to put your finger on exactly what's going on. You have different, now you sort of throw open all of the possibilities. Um, to, um, you know, population dynamics, founder effect, um, and other, and multiple pathways of how a virus might replicate, um, a little better, um, at any part of the replication cycle. Um, there's a lot going on there, which is also an opportunity. It's a great opportunity. So there's, you know, I think in one sense, it also illustrates that, um, you know, especially in real time, uh, infections in our own species, it's hard to know We have a lot to learn about how these viruses operate. And so I also look at it that way as, you know, and, and that's really what scientists do is, or, you know, it's like the analogy of the shark that needs to always be swimming to get enough <laughs> oxygen. That's a scientist always needs to be learning to, to, yeah. to um, you know, to be, per, to, to be a scientist it's sort of definitional that way. All right. Let me take uh, the next one from Per. Uh, hi, Nelson Vincent. Great episode 64 about variants and lineages. Here is an official webpage for Danish SARS-CoV-2 sequencing effort, which is quite impressive. Mm. B.1.1.7 increased from 4.1 to 7% of all sequence samples from week one to two with some regional variation, and he gives a link to that. And uh, in fact, on the Grinch, you can see also that it's mm -hmm. number two after the UK in the number of 117 genomes. So thanks, Per. Per is a, is a professor at Uppsala University. Yeah, this is a great resource. And um, as in the UK, uh, Denmark has a pretty impressive uh, surveillance effort in place and some nice visualizations. Um, and so, you know, following his link, just doing a quick peek at whole Denmark, um, you know, you can see the case numbers um, where you have full genome sequenced into the thousands. Um, uh, just doing sequence. So I assume that that's, you know, you're just, you're just kind of quickly genotyping. There are a couple of quick um, assays you can do um, to know that you're um, dealing, which um, lineage you're dealing with, et cetera. Um, and then, uh, you know, watching, watching the case numbers. And again, the prevailing wins are the numbers just across the board are down. Um, and then it's with some cases with B117, um, you know, uh, taking over what, what, what uh, the sort of diminishing returns of case numbers. Um, and that's a, a pattern that's uh, pretty clear in Denmark as it, it was as B117 rose to higher numbers. Um, and so a good example, actually, I would say of, um, uh, of local surveillance. Uh, also with the other lineages in there, and you can see how, um, you know, not prevalent P1, P2, um, some of the other Europe ones that were identified in Europe, which are, mm -hmm. Um, also circulating. And then this is, you know, getting back to George's question, um, there are some cases or, or now there are some um, situations where, um, you know, we've moved away from the lineage and are now specifically interested or just uh, regardless of lineage, just interested in a single mutation. These are mostly in the spike. There's some of the kind of are becoming household names, the N501Y mutation, also colloquially called Nelly. Um, the E484K <laughs> mutation, I think colloquially called EEK, um, and you can kind of just follow those mutations um, uh, in, regardless of lineage as well. So uh, any single mutation could be in multiple lineages would be another yeah. way of saying it. Yeah. Right. Let's do, how about we do one more each, Nels? Sounds good. So um, next one up. Hi, folks. Uh, a little, uh, I appear, if I appear rude, I don't mean to. It's just that I have the <laughs> diplomatic skills of a cinder block. <laughs> I admire the work <laughs> that all of you do. A little snow here. I'm currently in Derby Derbyshire, England. It's about zero degrees centigrade. Uh, the rosy-fingered dawn is spreading in pink light across the white landscape. The waves in the cloud make the dawn truly rosy-fingered. 
Uh, in twelve sixty four, at about one hour nine minutes twenty three seconds, uh, give or take, uh, Nels LD says, uh, "When we say B one seventeen, uh, what are we actually talking about? It's actually not a single virus. It's a lineage." Uh, and it's kind of weird reading your own quote, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's variants constantly getting spit out. The original version of B117 was described for its 23 mutations compared to the reference strain out of Washington. And of course, that's slightly arbitrary as well. 17 of those mutations, which are non-synonymous or lead to coding changes, uh, and there are some deletions in there. And those mutations are thought to be potentially the most consequential. Uh, there's a YouTube link. Um, I'm getting chided from our letter writer for referring to B117. I will <laughs> um, confess to that. Um, you know, as pointed out in the, that quote was from our <laughs> past the first hour of podcasting, anything to save some time, I will, um, you know, in the yeah. naming of, if I, if I was saying B1.1.7, we wouldn't be getting out of here for three hours or something like that. Uh, more seriously, uh, following from a point Amy Rosenfeld alluded to on TWIV, um, this is an RNA virus. So synonymous mutations can affect secondary and tertiary RNA structure with meaningful chemical effects, such as changes in rates and reliability of transcription. And so rates of further mutations and translation stability, example, 2' prime hydrolysis and conceivably even uh, ribos uh, ribozymatic activity of the RNA itself, um, though if the last were true, we'd expect high conservation or convergent evolution, I guess. Um, uh, so uh, I'll just kind of well, another paragraph, but just to stop there, it's a really good point from Amy about um, the nature of mutations. And again, our a lot of our attention is focused on the mm -hmm. coding point mutation. Um, and I think we underappreciate um, the other mutational mechanisms out there. It's just harder to measure or to, to, and so it's a little bit of the, um, you know, sort of an ascertainment bias. That's really a, a, a great point from Amy. I totally agree with her. Um, so, uh, and, and a good one to lift up too. So minor comment, um, I get the significance of DNDS, but when it's spoken as DNDS, uh, I hear DMDS. I find it make hard, find it to make hard of, it's hard to make sense of. DN by DS would be clearer and more explicit. If Mr. Racchianello didn't take so much trouble over the sound quality, this kind of problem would be a lot worse. Uh, paper ease can be hard to understand when spoken. I know journals still require papers to be written in clumsy and unnatural paperese, <laughs> but now nearly everything uh, is read via the web. And so it's time to start writing and speaking in simple, clear style, whether journals like it or not. Uh, my background, I do mostly electronic stuff in Cambridge, occasionally in California. I have degrees that say maths, but if you squint at my undergrad degree in the, uh, in the, from the right angle, they may look like physics or engineering degrees. I've had an armchair interest in molecular biology since I did chemistry um, A level. I guess it's a, uh, a bit like freshman chemistry in the US. I maybe know just enough about molecular biology to know I'm kind of clueless about it. With many thanks and best wishes, John. Hey, John, thanks for your note and gr <laughs> great to engage in the conversation. And I agree. I'm, um, you know, in debt to Vincent for the energy that he puts into our audio quality, the whole production. Um, the fact that we're live streaming today, everything. And so um, I appreciate the, um, yeah, well, and my own pronunciation, uh, you know, DNDS is one thing. It gets even worse when I try to <laughs> tackle some of the names of the incredible scientists, science heroes that we that we try to lift up here. But um, appreciate uh, uh, your thoughts and 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 really the, the feedback, the guidance as we all are um, uh, trying to communicate in simple, clear, effective ways. It's definitely a learning process, the same way the scientific process is one. I think the communicating process is one of learning and, and growth as well. All right, one more from Sheila. Dear Vincent and Nels, greeting from Oxford, where it's chilly six degrees C. I've been a TWIV listener since spring when a friend recommended it and looked to you for clear explanations. I'm no scientist, but my levels of understanding have definitely gone up thanks to TWIV. Hmm. Thanks so much for episode 64 of Twivo. It's the first episode I've listened to, but gave me a great deal of information about what you understand about the current new variant in the UK. There's been so much scaremongering, and I have been hoping to hear something on Twiv about it, so I was delighted when I 
came upon a Twivo. I felt I needed to write and thank you. As Vincent referred to unpleasant mail from people, you're doing the right thing by sticking to the science and giving the wider public a balanced view of where the science is right now. As someone living in the UK, it does feel as though somewhat, something different is going on with the pandemic at the moment. The people I know aren't behaving differently, but we all now know people who have recently caught the virus. On the other hand, the vaccine rollout appears to be going really well. Hmm. Thank you again for all you do to communicate science. Well, thank you, you Sheila. We try, yeah. and I like uh, this. Not, Nels is a level-headed fellow, so I, I enjoy <laughs> talking about this with him. <laughs> no, no. Well, we, I think, both you and I, Vincent, we like we welcome the criticism. The like, let's throw it around. Let's talk it out. Let's have the conversations. I think yeah, where it does sure. kind of it can though, and this happened a little bit. I think at the turn of the new year where it became a little more personal um, and, you know, let's talk about the science and the data and maybe a little less about the scientists practicing it um, and, and, and yeah. keep it on that level. I think we're all doing our best um, and, and learning as we go, but no, thank you, Sheila. I'm really glad that, that you found our conversations to be of interest. I can't resist this last question from the <laughs> chat. Could you give examples of cases, how a variant might become more fit so that it spreads other than becoming more transmissible. Uh, so transmissible mm. means the spread of a virus through the population. And one mm -hmm. component of that is going in, in droplets from one person to another. Another component would be making more virus in the upper tract so that there's more in the droplets. Another yep. would be to shed longer. The, the mutation makes the virus reproduce longer in the upper tract, which would give you more opportunity to spread. Uh, it, another would be to evade immunity in the host. Mm -hmm. Those are some, right, Nels? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'll get a little bit fanciful. You can even imagine if the virus somehow encodes behavioral changes, you <laughs> cause your host to go and sneeze on another host, or you cause your host even to like convince other hosts not to get yeah. vaccinated. <laughs> Those are totally just daydreaming. But the bigger point is that there's as we've said, you know, and Vincent is is exactly right. So many routes and ones that we know about, and probably ones that we don't, um, in terms of the complicated physiology of uh, infected um, host. Maybe stability, greater stability in the environment, right? A lot of things, absolutely, yeah. yeah, exactly right. No. All right, Nels, let's do some picks to wrap this up. Sounds good. So I'm excited about this one. Uh, just kind of caught this one as I was surfing along Twitter. So this is called Radio Garden. Got the link up http radio.garden and it's really it's just like a um you can sample radio stations from around the world and it's a great i think what makes this cool is the interface so it's like the google earth um you know spinning globe on your computer screen and then these glowing red uh, green dots which are different radio stations broadcasting from around the world and so you just the way the globe spins and you have a little um finder a uh, little target that when it finds one of these green dots, it takes you to that location in the world hmm. and then it tunes in that radio station. So, you know, right before we got on here, I was in Hamilton, Bermuda, listening to some reggae and imagining the waves and the beach just sort of rolling over. It's actually really fun, kind of a quick escape and reminds you, hmm. reminds me of just what a big world it is and how, you know, especially in the last year, as we've hunkered down, how much I kind of miss that. Uh, you know, so I've heard... Some people will um, go on to Zillow, the real estate um, website, <laughs> and just go to you know, you know, go to different locations across the country and just sort of, you know, go through houses in different neighborhoods. Um, this has a little bit of that energy, sort of this like, um, yeah. you know, almost traveling from your desktop in some ways. And and so I thought this one was kind of fun. A lot of uh, listeners also agree with you that they like Radio Garden. Yeah, very cool. How about yes. you, Vincent? What's what's your science pick? Uh, so mine is a is a website. Well, it's a fabulous website called Our World in Data, and, um, and mm -hmm. you can find a lot of data there. But particularly the uh, coronavirus pandemic part, where you can look at, uh, you know, vaccinations all over the place, cases, deaths, testing, hospitalizations, and oh, so wow. for example, let's look at vaccinations mm -hmm. uh, right now. And I'm going to share this page with you cool. now so you can see yeah. this. So this uh, is total doses administered per 100 people. Look who's leading the world. 
<laughs> it's Israel. There's, yeah, exactly. Followed, yep. followed by the United Arab Emirates, the UK. <laughs> U.S. is way down to like 20 doses mm -hmm. per 100 people, 20% mm -hmm. population. So so Israel is like 88.77%. Uh, yeah, it's really impressive. And anyway, good this, early uh, returns. So you can go to... Uh, wow. You can go to case fatality rate if you'd like. Right there, mm. the highest is uh, Mexico. Mm. Uh, confirmed mm. cases is another one. It's just amazing. And the mm. cool thing is you can download all the raw data if you want to play with it yourself. So wow. the world and data. Yeah. Isn't that cool? <laughs> so cool. I wasn't aware of that. And that's such a neat tool to sort of, yeah, look at. I mean, there's so much, again, that fire hose of data to even just sort of be able to visualize it or look at it in different ways. Um, somehow there's some, you know, I think there's something really almost therapeutic in that trying to grapple with all of the unknown around us to sort of, um, you know, have different ways of measuring and kind of comparing things. There's, yeah, that's really cool. Thank you for that. I'm going to spend probably yeah, too much time could. this afternoon surfing around on that one. Yeah. Yeah. You can spend a lot of time on that. Hmm. All right. We're at 99 likes, uh, my dear, uh, <laughs> listeners, why don't you push it over a hundred before we go? Uh, and in the meanwhile, I'll wrap up Tweevo number 65. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash Tweevo. And that's where you'll find links to all the things we've talked about today. A few people want to know where, you know, put them up. We will for every show. They'll be there. Absolutely. And if you uh, want to send a question or comment, and most of, most of you here, you get to ask us directly. That's pretty cool. Um, I'm enjoying it. Yeah, I love but, that. Uh, if you want to send them in, Twevo at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Nels Eldi is at cellvolution.org. On the Twitter, he's L Early Bird. Thank you, Nels. Hey, thank you, Vincent. Good to spend some time together. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. Music on Twevo is by trampled by turtles you've been listening to this week in evolution a podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick thanks for joining us we'll see you next month bye bye nels see you soon i gotta find the end thing here where is <laughs> we'll be live streaming Oops, that's not it that's not it tw 24 hours straight I don't know where the end shot is. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I'm going to end this and I'll say goodbye to you. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone.